Hello, and welcome to Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week 2021. My name is Nami Echelov, and I'm the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio's director, as well as the interim CEO for the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. We want to thank you for joining us for this special program, as well as to thank the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission for underwriting all the production costs associated. In case you'd like to see any of our other programs or other resources available put forth by the museum, please make sure to check out the Holocaust Memorial Museum's website at hmmsa.org. And now for our program. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Zucker, and I'm the Director of Jewish Engagement and Learning at the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. Thank you for joining us for this important week of Holocaust education. The phrase, never again, is often associated with the Holocaust to represent that we can never let another atrocity, such as the Holocaust, happen again. But never again has unfortunately happened again and again. Even today, human rights violations are taking place throughout the world and even in our own country. In the words of Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. It is our hope that the lessons you learn this week will inspire you to keep learning, to make your voices heard, to be an upstander, and not to remain indifferent to the suffering of others. Before I introduce our presenter, Mrs. Lisa Berry, I'd like to give you some background information on the Holocaust. The Holocaust was the systematic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of approximately six million Jewish people by the Nazi regime and its collaborators from 1933 to 1945, when two-thirds of the Jews of Europe were murdered. The Nazis were motivated by nationalism and a false belief in German racial superiority, though they gained power, territory, and wealth through this assault. Racial purity was their primary motivation. The Nazis also targeted millions of other defenseless human beings of other faiths and nationalities, anyone who spoke against the regime, including people with intellectual and developmental dis disabilities, physical disabilities, Roma and Sinti, gay men, Polish people, Jehovah's Witnesses, and other Eastern European people were murdered in cold blood. Adolf Hitler, the leader of the Nazi party, was obsessed with the hatred of Jews. A steady drumbeat of anti-Semitic propaganda or anti-Jewish propaganda in his speeches aroused public anger and hostility. Thousands of people became involved in the Nazi campaign of human destruction that claimed the lives of millions of innocent people. Six million of them were Jewish. Hitler did not invent genocide, mass murder, or propaganda. All of those occurred before and after the Holocaust. It is our hope that this education will prevent genocide and create a just and tolerant society. In the words of Maxine Cohen, the founder of our museum, the Holocaust is our legacy. We forget it at our peril. If we choose to learn from it, we may use it to light the path to a better world where all of us see ourselves in the faces of strangers. Throughout the final solution, Hitler and the Nazis sought to destroy not only children of Jewish descent, but children belonging to the Roma and Sinti and other European peoples. For Jewish women and others deemed inferior, the Nazis sought to sterilize them so they could continue to work as slave labor, but be unable to have children in the event that they survived. 
Children faced many traumas during the Holocaust, from being forced to stop their education for being Jewish, to facing the conditions of the ghettos, where in many cases they would attempt to help their family by crossing through the ghetto walls to the non-Jewish side of the city to smuggle in food, medicine, and other supplies. Many of the brave children who attempted this were captured and killed by the Nazi guards. Young children were not able to perform forced labor and were among the millions sent to their deaths at the killing centers. Non-Jewish children that were racially valuable to the Nazi regime, an estimated 20,000 from Poland, and 20,000 from the Soviet Union, and another 10,000 from other Eastern European communities were forcibly taken from the families and sent to Germany to be Germanized and adopted by German families. 21 physical traits, such as eye and hair color, height and head shape, were evaluated by SS physicians. Did you know that forcibly removing children from one group to another is considered an act of genocide? There were some children who were able to escape Europe prior to the Holocaust through the kinder transport. This rescue effort brought upwards of 10,000 Jewish children from Nazi Germany and other German occupied territories to safety in Great Britain. While these children were able to survive the war in safety, the, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, many were left orphaned and in many cases were the only surviving member of their family. Now I'd like to introduce Ms. Lisa Berry, who is going to read to you a true story of children during the Holocaust. Hi, I'm Lisa Berry, and I've been a teacher for 25 years. I teach students the importance of tolerance and empathy, acceptance and inclusion using children of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was a time period between 1939 and 1945 where 11 million innocent people were unfairly judged and put to death. And of those 11 million, 6 million were Jewish people. But as shocking as those numbers are, can you believe that 1.5 million of them were children? Can you believe grown adults could be so cruel and heartless? The few who survived the starvation and the torture in concentration camps, some have shared their stories with us in lectures and books, and we need to be sure and listen and learn from these stories. If we know about our history, we're less likely to repeat the mistakes made in history. Now I'm going to read you a true story about two sisters sent to a concentration camp during World War II. While I read, I would like for you to think about the answers to these questions. Do you have brothers and sisters? If so, what is your relationship with your siblings like? And last, have you ever been in a situation where your sibling has helped you? The Promise, written by Nina Botts V and Margie Wolf, illustrated by Isabel Cardinal, published by Second Story Press. Rachel pulled herself out of her happy dream. In her sleep, she was free to be with her friends and go to school. But now the gong announced the beginning of another day in Auschwitz prison camp. Always afraid of what any moment might bring, Rachel inched closer to her older sister in the bunk bed they shared with four other girls. Wake up, she whispered in Toby's ear. I'm awake, Toby murmured. Her hand automatically reached into her pocket for the tin box. Good, the gold coins were safe. Do you still have them? Rachel whispered as they rose to face whatever danger the day might bring. Yes, I promised Mummy, didn't I? Toby sighed, remembering how the Nazis had made Rachel work the night they took all the Jewish adults away from their town. Rachel never had a chance to say goodbye to their parents, 
She wasn't there when their father gave Toby the tin box, saying, This is all we have to leave you. Three gold coins are hidden inside the shoe paste. Use them only if you have to. And Rachel hadn't seen how her mother pulled Toby close. Use the gold for something important, she said. You will know when the time is right. And above all, stay together. This is how you will both survive. Two years had passed since that terrible night. Their parents were never seen again. Both girls jumped as the door to Barrack 25 banged open. Achtung! Attention! The Nazi guard shouted. Line up in the yard. The German shepherd by her side snarled, always alert and ready to lunge at anyone. Once outside, the girls stepped forward as a prisoner called Roll and checked off their names. Sophie, present. Ava, present. Rachel, present. Lola, silence. Lola, Lola, cross her name off the list. She is gone, the guard hissed. Someone in line sobbed, and the guard yelled, Stop whining, stupid girl. Lola had been too sick to work the day before and had stayed in bed. When the others returned later, she had disappeared. They all knew Lola would not be back. Her friend Pesha wept herself to sleep. Please don't let us get sick, Toby prayed looking over at Rachel. Toby? The sound of her name startled the girl back to attention. She stepped forward. Present. One day, the prisoners built a wall of heavy field stones. The next day, they took it apart. The next day, they built it again. No one was brave enough to question such foolishness. Toby resisted in her own way. When the guards weren't watching, She'd stop working and stare defiantly at them. When they turned back, she'd quickly pick up a rock as if she had never stopped. Toby risked being caught and punished, but the risk was worth it to her. Ava thought she was fearless. Pesha thought she was reckless. But Rachel knew her sister best. This act of defiance was Toby's small victory over those who had taken away their parents and their freedom and made them into slaves simply because they were Jewish. Today, the guards were nastier than usual. Hurry, no talking, move faster, ordered one. Rachel turned to check on her sister and almost cried out. There, lying on the ground in plain view, was the tin of gold coins. What should Rachel do? She couldn't reach for the tin without being seen. Toby hadn't noticed and was passing another rock to Ava, and now one of the guards was coming closer with his dog. The animal was sure to sniff at it. She must act. Toby had looked after the coins for two years. Now it was up to her. Rachel pretended to stumble sideways and dropped the big stone she was holding on top of the tin, covering it. Clumsy girl, get back to work, the guard yelled. His dog crouched low. I'm sorry, it won't happen again, Rachel apologized. She stooped to pick up the rock, making certain she lifted the box along with it. After the guard left, Rachel changed places with Ava so she could be next to her sister. Are you okay? Toby asked, concerned. Rachel nodded. I have the shoe paste tin in my hand. Take it. Toby felt her pocket. Empty. She made sure no one was looking and then slid the box from Rachel's palm to her own. Pretending to wipe dirt from her hands, she slipped the tin back where it belonged. That night, the girls lay on their bunk, waiting to escape into sleep. 
I was so proud of you today, Toby murmured. Mommy and Daddy would be too. Rachel was surprised by the praise. I'm not nearly as courageous as you. I worry that I won't be able to keep our promise if a Nazi soldier tries to separate us. Toby shook her head. Don't be fooled. I'm not as brave as you think. I just act stronger than I feel. And I convince myself that I'm brave. She kissed her sister's cheek. But one thing I know, this insanity can't last forever. What we must do is survive until this war ends. Rest now, Rachel. You saved us today. The next morning was cold and rainy. The prisoners were taking apart the wall they had built the day before. Their teeth chattered on the march back to camp. Most of them warmed up after a while, but by nighttime, Rachel was still shivering. The girls tried to help. Sophie gave Rachel her dinner soup. Pesha covered her with her own flimsy blanket. Ava rubbed her ice cold hands. Toby held her close trying to calm the shaking as Rachel fell asleep in her arms. Everyone remembered how Lola had disappeared. Rachel needed to be well for morning roll call. The Nazis didn't keep those who were too weak to work. But by dawn, Rachel was no better. I heard all over. Let me sleep a little longer, she pleaded. You can't, Toby urged. I'll do your share of work today if you just get up. But Rachel couldn't. Hunger and hard labor had taken their toll. So when Rachel's name was called that morning, Toby stepped forward, trying to control the tremor in her voice. My sister has a cold today, nothing serious. Tomorrow she will be better. The guard signaled the prisoner to erase Rachel's name from the list. Toby's knees buckled. She begged to stay with Rachel and do a double shift the next day, but the guard ignored her. For the first time since coming to Auschwitz, the sisters were separated. Toby worked feverishly all day with no thought of defying the guards. Frantic with worry, she couldn't wait to get back to the barrack. But on her return, just as she feared, their bunk was empty. They took Rachel, she cried. I have to find her before it's too late. It is too late, Pesha said softly. Don't make trouble, or you will disappear as well. There's nothing to be done. Sophie spoke gently. She's gone. You are a prisoner yourself. What can you do? Asked Ava. Toby listened to the girls, but couldn't accept what they were saying. You may be right, she said, but I'm going to find her. She's my sister. The others could hear the determination in her voice. A plan began to form in Toby's head. I still have the coins, she thought. Quick, Ava, give me your scarf. Rachel might need it to hide her face. Ava handed her a scarf and so did Pesha. You may need one yourself, she said. Rachel's probably in barrack number 29. That's where they keep sick people until... Ava cut her off. Be careful. Rachel admired your bravery, but thought you took too many chances. She worried about you. Tears stung Toby's eyes. At home, she had treated Rachel like an annoying little pest, always tagging along. Now, she would do anything to save her sister. Pray for us, she said. As Toby moved toward the door, she thought, if I'm caught, this will be the last time I see these friends. In Barrack 29, Rachel was losing hope. We are all in such danger here. 
she had whispered to an old woman beside her. Do you think help will come? They were watching the barrack guard write a list as she strolled between the bed of sick prisoners. The elderly woman answered her gently. There is no help for anyone in Auschwitz. Then, seeing how her words had frightened the girl, she added, I suppose miracles do happen, sometimes. Trying to avoid the guard's attention, Rachel had found a place to cry alone. She pictured her sister's face. Would Toby survive without her? They did need a miracle. All the prisoners in Auschwitz did, but it seemed the world had forgotten them. Reaching toward the sandy ground, Rachel scratched the letters T-O-B-Y with her finger. Outside, the guard was just leaving Barrack 29. Toby darted behind a storage shed, but the German shepherd saw her and strained at its leash. Impatient for supper, the guard yanked her dog forward and passed within inches. Toby collapsed against the wall, terrified. When her heart slowed, she peeked around the corner. An inmate, a prisoner who hoped to survive by helping the Nazis, was now guarding Barrett 29. Toby recognized her. Perhaps this was a bit of good luck. She scurried forward. My sister's inside, Toby whispered. Please let me in. Impossible, the guard hissed, looking away. Toby knew what she must do. I'll give you a gold coin if you help me. The guard's eyes shifted slightly. It's too dangerous. Two coins then, please. We only have each other. Come, the woman pulled Toby inside. Toby took the tin from her pocket and dug out two coins. The guard snatched them and rubbed away the shoe paste until the gold glimmered. Satisfied, she pocketed them. Hurry, she ordered. Toby searched frantically but couldn't find Rachel. She rushed back to the guard. Did they already take my sister? The guard shrugged. I'll check again. No, make my risk worthwhile. Toby removed the last coin. Here, she said, it's all I have. There is no more. This time, Toby was extra careful. She noticed a doorway and peered through it. There was her sister in a small fenced in area behind the barrack. Toby cried out and ran to embrace Rachel. We have to get away. Come with me now. The girl ran toward the waiting guard. Be quiet or we will all be shot, the woman hissed. Toby handed Ava's scarf to her sister. Put it on. Breathless and shaking, the two girls slipped out into the gloom. How did you? Shh. Toby cut her off. Come on. In Barrack 25, the girls were greeted with hugs, tears of joy, and lots of questions. You risked everything for me, Rachel said. You are my pesky little sister. What else was I supposed to do? Rachel smiled. And you are the bossy miracle I needed. For that one single night, the prisoners of Barrack 25 forgot to be afraid. No one wanted to think about what would happen when the sun rose. When the roll call ended that morning, every girl except one had stepped forward at the sound of her name. The guard looked at Rachel, astonished. You are not supposed to be here. How did you get back? She demanded. Toby spoke up. I took her out of Barrack 29. As the guard and her dog moved forward, Toby added, I had to. I promised my parents we would stay together. Blame me, Rachel cried. 
I was sick. My sister was trying to protect me. The guard pointed at Toby. Move out of line and unbutton your dress, face the wall. She bent to unhook the dog and ordered it to stay. No one made a sound until the guard began whipping Toby's bare back with the leash. Rachel cried out for the guard to stop, but she continued. When it was finally over, Toby fell to the ground and Rachel rushed to her side. The guard clipped the leash to the dog's collar. I've done my job, she told Toby. You have been punished. Then, to everyone's amazement, she turned to the prisoner at her side, put Rachel's name back on the list. She can stay with her sister. Shouts of relief filled the air as the guard marched away. Toby and Rachel stared after her in disbelief. Was it possible that their love for each other had touched the heart of a Nazi guard? They would never know. The scars on Toby's back remained for a long time, but when the Nazis were finally defeated and the surviving prisoners were freed, Rachel and Toby left the camp, hand in hand, carrying an empty shoe paste tin. The coins were gone, but the promise had been kept. Epilogue. Toby on the right and Rachel on the left remained devoted sisters and best friends for the next 50 years. Even when distance separated them, their hearts and spirits were always together. They remained forever friends with those girls from Barrack 29, 25 who also survived. The authors, who are close cousins, wrote this story as told to them by their mothers. Nina Botsvi is a journalist and radio host based in Tel Aviv. She, her sister Bila, and her brother Yehudi are Rachel's children. Margie Wolf is a publisher of books for adults and children in Toronto. She and her sister Helen are Toby's daughters. About the illustrator. Isabel Cardinal has been an illustrator for 17 years. Her style emerged through the years as her own original way of doing digital collage, using a collection of Victorian era photos, along with her own textures, photos, and drawings. She lives near Montreal, Quebec. And for the teachers, this has a free downloadable teacher's guide. I would like to also share with you a few stories that I would encourage you to go check out in your library. This book called The Harmonica, it is a wonderful story, also has a downloadable teacher's guide. This is a true story. When the Nazis invaded Poland, a families split, split apart. The parents are sent to one concentration camp and their son to another. Only his father's gift, a harmonica, keeps the boy's hopes alive and miraculously ensures his survival. When an officer discovers his talent, he makes the boy play each night. Through music, the boy invokes his parents and brings comfort to the other prisoners, lifting their spirits, if only for a moment in time. The Yellow Star is an upstander book, um, an award-winning book. In 1940, Nazis occupied Denmark and King Christian the X, beloved amongst all his people, has to find some way to resist the overwhelming power of the Nazis. When the order goes out that all Jews must wear a yellow star on their clothes, the king has an idea that just might work. 
but it would take the faith and commitment of all the Danes. This is a great book for the youth, Benno and the Night of Broken Glass. A neighborhood cat observes the changes in German and Jewish families in Berlin during the period leading up to Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass. This cat's eye view introduces the Holocaust to children in a gentle way that can open discussion of this period in time. Terrible Things by Eve Bunting can also be used with a very famous statement by Pastor Nymoller during World War II. This book is about animals in the clearing were content until the terrible things came capturing all creatures with feathers. This is a recommended text in Holocaust education programs across the U.S. It's a unique introduction to the Holocaust and it encourages young children to stand up for what they think is right without waiting for others to join them. This is a great upstander book as well, Irena Sendler and the Children of the Warsaw Ghetto. Irena Sendler is a Polish social worker she helped nearly 2,500 Jewish children out of the Warsaw Ghetto and into hiding during World War II. And finally, a short novel, I Am a Star, written by the survivor herself, Inga Auerbacher. Inga's childhood was a happy and peaceful uh, until that when Germany invaded her land in 1942. By then the Nazis were in power and because Inga's family was Jewish, she and her parents were sent to a concentration camp. The Auerbachers defied death for three years and were finally freed in 1945. In her own words, Inga Auerbacher tells her family's harrowing story and how they carried with them ever after the strength and courage and will that allowed them to survive. We all have choices to make each day. You can choose to do the right thing and be an upstander. And that's someone who stands up to help someone else in need. Each day you can choose to be a better person than you were the day before. What a gift that is. Choose to be an upstander. Stand up and speak up for what is right and true and just and good. And you'll find others will do the same for you. I leave you with words of wisdom from my hero, Irena Sendler, a Polish Catholic woman who saved 2,500 children from the Warsaw Ghetto. Don't sow seeds just for food. Sow seeds for good. Then try to make that circle around you bigger every day. Thank you, Ms. Berry, for your work as an educator, as well as your part in getting Senate Bill 1828, a unanimously passed Texas state bill enacting Holocaust Remembrance Week passed. As Ms. Berry mentioned, during the Holocaust, 1.5 million Jewish children perished at the hands of the Nazis and their collaborators. At Yad Vashem in Israel, there is a memorial dedicated to the children murdered by the Nazis. In this memorial seen here, in these photos, names of the children, as well as their age, country of origin, are read out loud so that their names are remembered in history. Memorial candles, a tradition in the Jewish faith, are presented in the middle of the memorial. The reflection of the candles creates an impression of millions of stars symbolizing the children. Many of the books that Ms. Berry suggested in her presentation are available in our HMM essay, Educational Trunks, which educators can borrow and are provided through generous contributions from the Alex and Sally Hauf Foundation, the Charity Ball Association, the Delkowitz Charitable Trust. These trunks are available for a period of four weeks and come in high school, middle school, elementary, and Spanish versions. For more information about our educational trunks and other educational resources, visit hmmsa.org.